Well, welcome to another episode of FishingLocalWaters.com. Today, we're fishing the Big Bone Lick Creek, and um, I want to tell you the history about this area. Honestly, I didn't know that there were so many stories to pick from. Uh, I could pick from the Lewis and Clark Expedition, the Mary Ingalls story, uh, the Salt Licks, uh, the hotels that used to be up on the banks here where people came for miles around to be able to bathe in the Salt Licks. Um, but I think the story that I want to tell you about involves the massive bones that was found in this area. And I haven't decided what to call the episode, but it's like the big bone heist or the stolen bones. But what I'm going to tell you is it's got all the makings of an Indiana Jones story. So as soon as we get back from the break, we'll tell you all about it. And I want to thank you once again for spending another day with us at FishingLocalWaters.com. Welcome to another episode of FishingLocalWaters.com. Remember, if you're fishing, you're almost always fishing in someone's local waters. So when on private land, talk to the owners and ask permission. And always be courteous and good stewards whenever you're on private or public properties. As a reminder, if you haven't already, please subscribe below. It helps us and allows us to keep you informed. As always, we hope you enjoy this segment of FishingLocalWaters.com. I was fishing within Big Bone Lick Park, located in northern Kentucky. I recommend fishing farther downstream, past the confluence of Gum Branch and Big Bone Creek. From there to Boone's Landing, there are several great places to fish. After the bridge on Bender Road, the water deepens. From there to the river, you may want to consider a boat, a kayak, or a float tube. Now, every October, the Big Bone Lick Park features the Salt Festival. This area is packed full of notable historic names, such as Mary Draper Ingalls, who in October of 1755 escaped from the Shawnee right here at Big Bone Lick. She and another woman traveled for 40 days. They crossed 145 creeks in our rivers and trekked over 450 miles. She arrived home in Eggleston, Virginia on December the 1st, 1755. And then during the Civil War, the Confederate General John Hunt Morgan and Captain Thomas Hines escaped from a Union prison in Columbus, Ohio. They dined at a Boone County home where community members gathered to meet the Southern General. After dinner, the two men were escorted in the middle of the night right past Big Bone Lick, across Mud Lick Creek, and escaped through Gallatin County. <laughs> I reckon it could be said that these folks truly believed in Southern hospitality. But the story I want to tell you involves Lewis and Clark, Thomas Jefferson, Dr. Goforth, William Bullock, and a devious Thomas Ash. Long before the white man arrived in Kentucky, the Indians knew of the great bones that were visible in the banks of the lick and massed in this area. European accounts of the bones can be traced back to a 1765 report from Colonel George Cogham. Ben Franklin wrote about the bones in 1767, and Thomas Jefferson wrote about these elephant bones in 1781 in the book that he titled notes on the state of Virginia. On page 40 of this book, he records a story told by a Delaware chief that when asked by the governor of Virginia, the chief stood and said, In ancient times, a herd of these tremendous animals came to big bone licks and began a universal destruction of the bear, deer, elks, buffaloes, and other animals which had been created for the use of the Indians. That the great man above looking down and seeing this, was so enraged that he seized his lightning, descended on the earth, seated himself on a neighboring mountain, on a rock of which his seat and the print of his feet can still be seen, and hurled his bolts among them till the whole of them was slaughtered, except for the big bull who presented his forehead to the shafts, shook them off as they fell, but missing one at length, it wounded him in the side, whereon, springing round, he bounded over the Ohio, over the Wabash, the Illinois, and finally over the Great Lakes, 
where he is living to this day. Even today, there are different theories on why so many bones were in this area. Some say the mammoth animals sunk into the jelly ground that surrounded the licks. Others wonder if the salt intake itself may have killed the animals, while others ponder if man took advantage of the animals' attraction to the salt licks, killed the animals for meat, and left the bones. I tend to lean towards the stories told by the original inhabitants. A few years ago, lightning did kill a herd of 18 elephants in India. Perhaps the old Delaware chief knew more than what we first thought. Regardless, animals and humans were attracted to the salt licks, and the bones of several different species accumulated over thousands of years does leave room for several correct overlapping theories. A large number of these bones were still here in 1801 when Jefferson became president. Jefferson was passionate about having these bones collected. Personally, his scientific curiosity had been piqued, and he believed that the study of these bones would advance scientific studies and place the new nation onto the world stage. <laughs> when it comes to bones, size does matter, and everybody wanted the biggest bones. Jefferson was a leading member of the American Philosophical Society and was working through this organization to establish the means to collect these bones. This task wasn't going to be easy. In 1801, several Indian nations still occupied Kentucky. The Trail of Tears did not start until 1830. The first steam-powered boat on the Ohio River was the New Orleans, and she wasn't built until 1811. The falls of the Ohio laid downstream in Louisville, Kentucky, and working a keel boat upstream was hard work. The American Philosophical Society was in Philadelphia, and the bones were 600 miles away, hidden in the dark and bloody lands of Kentucky. But Thomas Jefferson was not the only one interested in these bones. Others recognized the value and significance of these archaeological artifacts and the Indiana Jones-style race to find, collect, and transport these bones was already underway. And just like in the movies, there was government influences that went straight to the top. Hostile natives, treachery, heroes, and foreign and domestic villains. In 1800, Dr. Goforth settled in Cincinnati and was the first doctor in the frontier west to acquire and administer the smallpox vaccination in 1801. Soon thereafter, he learned of the bones located 43 miles downstream at Big Bone Lick. In 1803, he began an archeological dig in the area. On April the 30th of the same year, the United States signed the Louisiana Purchase Treaty with Napoleon and the French government for $15 million. The American Philosophical Society began to make plans for the Lewis and Clark expedition into the Louisiana Territory. And on October the 4th, 1803, Lewis, at the request of Thomas Jefferson, stopped at Big Bone Lick on his way to Louisville to meet up with Clark. It was obvious to Lewis that Dr. Goforth had already beaten him to the bones. He would return, but winter was setting in, and he needed to get to Louisville and on to St. Louis to start the expedition on May 14, 1804. While Lewis and Clark was exploring the Louisiana Purchase, Dr. Goforth extracted five to six tons of fossilized bones at Big Bone Lick and began to work them up the Ohio River, most likely via keelboats to a Dr. Richardson in Pittsburgh. His plan was to sell the bones to the American Philosophical Society or to Charles Peel, who owned the first public museum in the United States and had a master done already on display in his museum. However, when the bones arrived in Pittsburgh, the American Philosophical Society was focused on the Lewis and Clark expedition and they knew Lewis and Clark would be encouraged to return to Big Bone Lick after completing their expedition. This left Charles Wilson Peel, who was also connected to the American Philosophical Society and was reluctant to enter into negotiations that upstaged Thomas Jefferson or the Society. Therefore, negotiations stalled for about two years while the bones laid in Pittsburgh under the care of Dr. Richardson. At the same time, some say that the Irish-born writer, Thomas Ashe, was either residing in Washington, D.C. and contributing to the National Intelligencer newspaper, 
are getting thrown out of the British Army in Canada. It's hard to say. For Thomas Ashe's writing quill had a very large inflated imagination that sprinkled in a few facts here and there that was obtained from others to create credibility. Sorting these small tidbits of truth from the embellishments is difficult. Here's what we believe happened. Somehow, Thomas Ashe learned about the bones in Pittsburgh, the stalled negotiations, and that Dr. Goforth lived in Cincinnati. From whom he collected this information, we are unsure. However, this does place him in the company of individuals that knew the inner working of the American Philosophical Society. In late 1806, he took on the identity of a Frenchman. He called himself Arville instead of Ash, and he traveled to Cincinnati to meet with Dr. Goforth. He convinced Mr. Goforth that if others refused to pay the asking price, he had interested parties in France, willing to pay top dollar for his collection. Of course, a contract would need to be fully executed, and delivery would need to be made before payments was rendered. Documents were prepared, and Thomas Ashe headed to Pittsburgh with documents in hand to obtain the release of the bones into his custody and care. In 1807, there was about 50 keelboats, each weighing 30 tons, transporting goods between Cincinnati and Pittsburgh. They, or smaller boats, would have handled the load. However, payment would have been required. Thomas Ashe was always known for being broke and needing money. Therefore, we believe he sold part of the bones of Pittsburgh to finance his trip. The collection was then loaded onto a killboat and floated to Louisville, where it would have had to been offloaded at the falls of the Ohio and transported via wagon around the falls and reloaded on a second killboat for the trip to Memphis and on to New Orleans. As Thomas Ashe was making arrangements to transport Dr. Goforth's collection down the Ohio and the Mississippi rivers, Thomas Jefferson was writing David Ross, the owner of the land at Big Bone Lick, and requesting permission to perform another archaeological dig at the site. Later in December of 1807, Jefferson wrote to William Clark thanking him for his efforts in obtaining the bones and requesting that they be shipped by way of New Orleans. This means that the kill boat carrying Dr. Goforth's now stolen bones and Mr. Ash passed within two miles of Clark and his dig site at Big Bone Lick. When Thomas Ash arrived in New Orleans, he made another attempt to sell the bones, but complained that the offer was too low, insulting and one-tenth the true value. So he decided to set sail for England. This trip likely included stops in Cuba and ports on the eastern coast of the United States and would then take on supplies and cross the Atlantic to London. After about 65 days after leaving Cuba, Thomas Ashe arrived in England where karma for equally devious characters awaited him. When the cargo was offloaded, the custom house officials seized the bones and demanded that Mr. Ashe place a value on the bones of which a 35% import tariff would be charged. If he placed a low value on the bones, the custom house had the right to seize the bones and pay him his quoted estimate plus 10%. Thomas Ashe had a dilemma, and he was about to meet his match. Enter William Bullock of Liverpool, the founder and operator of the Museum of Natural Curiosities at 24 Lord Street. In this pitiable and condemned state, I consigned the whole of my stupendous collection of organic remains to a Mr. Bullock of the Liverpool Museum. For the miserable and contemptible sum of £200, he engaging to extricate me from the custom house, by depositing the sum of £500, and paying the 35% on a sum to be named by arbitration, after the bill of view was carried into official effect. Reader, such was the issue of the most extraordinary and interested speculation that was ever undertaken by man. It made the fortune of Mr. Bullock, an entire stranger to me and to the design, and it left me a wretch in a state of mental darkness. However, Mr. Bullock was not done with this Irishman pretending to be a Frenchman, or the thief pretending to be a collector. 
He demanded that Mr. Ash write a chronological detailed account on how he collected the bones, in which Mr. Ash did by plagiarizing Dr. Goforth and once again allowing his imagination to run wild. Mr. Bullock now had written documentation from whom and how he obtained the bones. He was now free to display the bones. He sold Mr. Ash's written false account at the Liverpool Museum and later in the newly built Piccadilly Egyptian Hall open in 1812. Mr. Ash continued to write several articles and books and in 1808 released a book titled Travels in America in 1806. The critic in the London Quarterly Review wrote, he has spoiled a good book by engrafting incredible stories on authentic facts. He died broke on December the 17th, 1835 in Bath. To our knowledge, Thomas Ash or Arville never communicated with Dr. Goforth after he left Cincinnati. In a letter to Thomas Jefferson, Dr. Goforth details the missing bones and the lack of communication regarding their location and circumstances. In 1807, Goforth also rode a flatboat down the Ohio River and Mississippi River to Louisiana. There he became a parish judge in 1812 and was elected a delegate from Liberville Parish to the convention to write the Constitution for the state. He removed to New Orleans, where he was a surgeon for the regiment of volunteers during the invasion of the city by the British during the War of 1812. He decided to return to Cincinnati in 1816 and reached the city on December the 28th, 1816. He died May 12, 1817 in Cincinnati from hepatitis that he contracted on the river voyage the previous year. In 1819, William Bullock sold 32,000 items of his museum collection at auction. He took the proceeds and left England and purchased Elmwood Hall and 1,000 acres in now what is known as Ludlow, Kentucky, which is 36 miles from Big Bone Lick. He made several visits to Big Bone Lick during his stay in America. Bullock sold the estate in 1830 to Israel Ludlow son of one of Kentucky's founders and returned to England. Emwood Hall still stands today. We hope you enjoyed this segment and we look forward to seeing you again soon with another episode of FishingLocalWaters.com.